The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome to the show. Hope everybody had a good weekend. It's Monday. Lewis, how was the weekend? Any big shows? Any Krakatoa shows this weekend? No, not this weekend. Are you guys on some sort of hiatus? Um, no, we're just, uh, we're in a transitional period, if you will. What's the transition from and to? Uh, our other guitarist has uh, carpal tunnel. Oh, no. And needs to do like physical therapy. And right. So uh, we have a new guitarist coming in and we have a show on the 6th. Oh, boy. So we need to prepare for that. All right. We're going to get the details of that show soon. Yeah. we Will do. I was in Montreal over the weekend and I had a bunch of weird incidents. First of all, if, if people, anybody who is, I don't know if this is a Montreal thing, a Quebec thing or a Canada thing. What do blinking green lights mean on traffic lights? I have no idea what that means. Sometimes they'll just blink, and sometimes it's before they go to yellow, but sometimes it's just after being red. So I've, I've not been able to discern any pattern in the green light blinking. Yeah. Uh, never seen it, <laughs> never heard of it, no idea. I think it, it means that people, you're allowed to go through, but it's a highly dangerous area. <laughs> Is that really what it means? No, no. That would be interesting. Anyway, so that went Maybe on. Maybe it means you need to go extra fast. <laughs> I also had this, you know, when you're going on a long trip and it's a two, you know, two lane highway and you're constantly passing and being passed by the same two cars, except you've been going the same speed for a hundred miles. Yeah. I had that going on from the Canadian border down to, I don't know where, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. From Burlington, Vermont, all the way back into Massachusetts, I was being passed and passing the same two minivans. Uh, even though I was going 73 miles per hour on cruise control the entire time. Yeah. It, just pick a speed. I feel like I would do really well on the highway if I had a sign above my car where I could type messages and they would pop up. Like, for example, I've been going 73 miles an hour for the last 100 miles of highway. Let's figure out a way where we stop passing each other every 30 seconds. Or if you just had a little, or if the sign just said your speed. Yeah, that would be yeah. useful too. But then, of course, there's a lot of other issues with that. Right, like yeah. getting pulled over. Exactly. Yeah. Then I went to the. Have you Which been you're to very the, good at. Have you way. been to the Biodome in Montreal? Yes, long time the, ago. The Biodome's cool. I do worry, though, not so much about how the animals are treated in theory, but they have these rules like no flash photography because it makes the animals go nuts, and uh, you know, so on and so forth. People are taking flash photography with huge cameras all over the place. There's this thing where it's dark and there's bats there. And bats, presumably, I don't know, for whatever reason, they've decided it's dark where the bats are. People are lighting the whole thing up with flash photography. I, don't, I know that the bats are flying around. I could have sworn some of those bats were just fl uh, slamming into the ground every time the flash photography went off. I think they're being affected by those flashes, Lewis. I'm sure there is some type of effect. They yeah. need enforcement. They had a, a, a lynx, which was in this big space. The thing was like horrified and just pressed up against the wall. Kids are screaming, pounding on the glass. Even if the environment the animal is in is, is okay, you need to have some enforcement keeping people quiet. Like Natan, didn't you say at the Sistine Chapel, they keep people quiet because of how it affects the paintings. Imagine there's live animals here. Are you asking me? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's it's, true. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, yeah. I'm glad we got I to the mean, I think the problem is having these animals in captivity in the first place. You think so? Yeah. All right. Well, that's another story. But needless to say, it was a shocking experience. I also had this weird thing where yesterday in the morning we were trying to go get just a, like a quick breakfast and then go because we were going to Burlington for lunch on the way back. And we show up at this, uh, my girlfriend and I show up at this coffee place, which we're not familiar with. I kind of want to make sure it's not a chain and it's not going to be like basically they brew Starbucks or whatever. We try to go to local places, you know. So I think we're going to go in and check it out. But my sense is we're not going to want to stay. The second we walk in, a waitress comes up and says, oh, did you want to sit down? Blah, 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 blah. I want to buy us some time. Really what I want to do, is, I'm not going to say to, to her, but I want to say, I'm kind of looking around to see if this place is worth staying or if we want to walk somewhere else. But instead, the first thing I think of to give us time is, uh, we might be meeting people here. We're trying to figure it out. And then she kind of gives me a weird look and says, okay, like how do I not know if I'm meeting people here or not? Just the first thing that came to mind. Afterwards, we decide to stay. So then we're like, okay, we're going to stay. And she says, okay, so how many is it going to be? How many people are you, are you meeting? And I say, no, no, it's just two of us. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, it was that was off to a weird start. If I'm meeting people, well, it would have been fine if you said, "Oh, they they canceled. They're they're going somewhere else." Yeah, but then you know, there's this this individual uh, waitress. Her English was not great. She mostly spoke French, and uh, so that was like weird thing number one. <laughs> uh, 
Then it turns out it's like a coffee place, like a high end, not high end coffee place, but like a gourmet coffee place. And I don't drink coffee, and neither does my girlfriend. So I think there were orders of like tea and hot chocolate, which of course we get very weird looks because like the, the whole idea of this place is to order exotic coffees of different kinds. So that was strike two. And then strike three was. I asked, we were ordering, a, like, like they have baguette with different things that they bring you. And I asked, you know, how much of a baguette do you get? Do you, are you serving? Because we're trying to figure out how many servings do we need. And she thinks I'm asking the price of the baguette, which is very clear on the menu. And she says, oh, there's only a special price with the baguette if you're getting coffee. And it was just a, a nightmarish confusion. It was, it was a disaster. I mean, we basically were laughed out of the place. So it was em embarrassing, needless to say. I think the best thing for me when I walk in is just to be up front and say, we've never been here. We're just kind of checking out the scene or something. I mean, it was just a bad start saying, I'm, I might be meeting someone here. And then yeah. table for two, please. <laughs> not, not very slick. <laughs> not very slick at all. Yeah. You've had those incidents happen, haven't you? Um, I've certainly had weird, weird situations in, in foreign countries uh, you know, language barrier, what have you, but uh, nothing that weird. Nothing a few dollars couldn't fix for you. Right. There you go. Very good, Lewis. Yeah. I've got some incredible clips to play for you. Rick Santorum said that we will never have elite smart people on the side of the Republican Party. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, obviously you won't. This is what he had to say. Um, this is at the American Valley. I don't know where this was. He's in front of a, uh, a backdrop that has just about every hate organization listed on it. So it's your guess. Let's take a listen. We will never have the media on our side, ever, in this country. We will never have the elite, smart people on our side, <laughs> because they believe they should have the power to tell you what to do. There you go, right? Of course, conservatives never think they have the power to tell you what to do as far as, uh, you know, who you can marry or what procedures women need to have when they go to their doctor for private medical situations. Uh, Republicans would never dream of, in, of uh, invading your privacy. Obviously, you're not going to have the uh, smart people on your side. The more education people have, the more likely they are to be liberal. I think, therefore, I'm liberal just about sums up why you're never going to have the elite smart people on your side, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. And of all people to say that uh, the elite smart people want to tell you what to do. I mean, of all the candidates who wanted to tell people what to do. Santorum was, was <laughs> he was at public the top enemy of the list. number one. The Republican Party is the party that wants to tell you what to do. And amongst the Republican uh, primary candidates, it was Rick Santorum who was at the top of that list. Yeah, Absolutely. For sure. Uh, and also, this is the guy who thought it was bad for kids to go to college because college is indoctrinating. Yeah. Obama wants you to go to school just to get a liberal indoctrination. No, he wants you to go to school to think and learn critical thinking, which Texas wants to get rid of altogether. And that you know, it may lead you into uh, being a progressive politically. Imagine knowing more. That. Imagine that. The horror. Didn't he say during the primary that, I might be uh, uh, saying, quoting him wrongly, but something about they lose 60% of the crop to free thinking or something like that? I mean, it was, it was definitely gaff-worthy. I hope I'm not in attributing that incorrectly. To Don't me. remember that one. Very bizarre. Then Liz Cheney daughter of Dick Cheney, also Fox News contributor, she goes on Fox News and she says she's accusing Obama of everything under the sun. And in line with typical Republican nonsense, she accused President Obama of abandoning Czechoslovakia. Now, the only problem is Czechoslovakia hasn't existed since 1992. So that's going to cause a little bit of an issue. How can you accuse President Obama of abandoning a country that uh, hasn't existed since the president was what, in his 20s? I mean, this just doesn't make any sense. Here's Liz Cheney on This Week. It wasn't on Fox News. It was on ABC's This Week. Listen to this. The embassy's been attacked. The flag's been ripped down. The Al-Qaeda flag has been flown. For the America's president not to even mention it clearly sends a signal to radicals across the region. And, you know, I would disagree with George to the extent that yeah. we've now had three and a half years of Obama policy. And it looks an awful lot like whether you're talking about the Mexico City speech in 2009, the Cairo speech in 2009, uh, the extent to which he's been apologizing for America. He's abandoned some of our key allies like Israel, Poland, Czechoslovakia. He's <laughs> attempted to appease our... There you go, Lewis. Obama's so evil that he's taking our key allies like Czechoslovakia. And which, Poland? Which hasn't existed for 20 years 
and just flat out abandoning them. Amazing. What a, what a fabulous theory. This is a You know, in reality, I think we've all abandoned Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> we've abandoned it as far as uh, registering it in an atlas, in a yeah. current atlas. Also, there's... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, regarding this idea that uh, the Obama administration has uh, thrown Israel under the bus or anything similar to that idea, right. it doesn't make any sense. It's not backed up by the facts. It is true that Netanyahu and Obama have a crispy relationship. But uh, I think that that would happen with a lot of American leaders, uh, and it has nothing to do with their support for Israel. No question about it. I mean, it's just, it's, and le we could even go before that earlier in Liz Cheney's clip also. The president didn't apologize. I mean, we come on, we guys, we know the Libya, the Libya jig is up. Mitt Romney embarrassed himself. There was no apology. Romney was commenting on a statement that had been put out before the attacks even took place. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, uh, what, what is wrong with these people, Lewis? Explain it to me. I wish I could. You might Let's have find to ask, the answers. You might have to ask a psychiatrist. Let's find the answers in Czechoslovakia. That's really where President Obama's incredibly misguided yeah, foreign policy I, I, is seen. I don't really like the the apologist attack either. It's kind of, I mean, of course they're bringing back the, the making it seem like he's unpatriotic or something like that. Of but uh, you know, lowball. Here's my book recommendation for this week. Every Monday I do a book recommendation brought to you in part by a fashion of bastards, the best-selling satirical forecast of American politics circa 2015 by Joanna Louise Johnson. Find it on Amazon.com. Today's book recommendation, and I hesitate to do this because I know it's a long book. It took me a while to get through it, but it was absolutely worth it. Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. And I'm talking about the uncut version that was released uh, after the initial release. Of course, Lewis liking the uncut reference to our circumcision debate that seems to be ongoing. Um, Stranger in a Strange Land. It's a long book, Lewis. But it's excellent, and I, I, uh, um, I believe most people will enjoy it if they're able to get through the entire thing. Thank you, David. Always enlightening to hear about your, your book reviews. All right. Stranger in a Strange Land. Very, very good. Mm. Excellent book. Today, after the show at 3.15 p.m. Eastern, we're having a members video call-in. We'll be hanging out here in studio. Members with a webcam will be able to sign on. They'll be able to talk to us, ask questions. That's going to be great. We also have the bonus show. If you don't get the bonus show, You've got to sign up and become a member. Producer Lewis hosts it, produces it, writes it, captions it. I mean, just you do the whole thing. I do. I even uh, sign it for the people who who are hard of hearing and cannot. Uh, I'm just kidding. I don't do that. An ASL or SEE? -E? I don't even know what those are. Okay. Uh, levitation and pharmaceuticals today on the bonus show. We'll also talk about can sex make you smarter? Lewis doing very involved research into that topic, as well as the world's most interesting man holding an Obama fundraiser, and what's that all about? davidpackman.com slash membership. Pennies a day, and you support independent media. Let's take a break. We'll be back with more after this, and then Scott Keeter on what's going on in those swing states between Obama and Romney. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Feedback video and animation at feedbackvideo.net. DIF Design, specializing in custom business websites at difdesign.com. ShareFile, provider of secure file transfer for businesses at sharefile.com. At last, someone has stood up for America's downtrodden. I mean, of course, the downtrodden Wall Street banks. This defender of fat cat bankers moans that the public anger at the behemoths is unprecedented. He wails at poor Wall Streeters, publicly assailed as greedy, are having to fend off, quote, the misguided idea that we should break up the nation's largest banks. And who is this champion of the Goliaths? William Harrison, the guy who engineered the mergers that created the J.P. Morgan Chase Goliath and became fabulously rich as the conglomerate CEO before retiring in 2006. But Harrison sprang out of retirement this August to write an op-ed piece in the New York Times pleading for public appreciation of bank giantism. He called the consolidation of these financial businesses a natural market-driven evolution toward efficiency citing Starbucks and big box retailers like Walmart as models. Bad examples, Bill. 
Both are relentless predators that profit by devouring the economic vitality of local businesses, employees, suppliers, and whole communities as they stamp their sterile brand of uniformity across the land. Then, the poor guy tumbled headfirst into Credibility Gulch with a patently preposterous claim that Wall Street does not have, quote, inordinate influence on the political process, nor, he added, does it get huge implicit subsidies from the government. This is Jim Hightower saying, as for his cry that today's public anger at too-big-to-fail banks is unprecedented, Harrison needs a remedial course in American history. My own state's first constitution even outlawed banks. Of course people are angry today. The very banks he's defending, including his, are lawless entities that admit to rigging interest rates, money laundering, fraud, and careless speculation. So yes, bust them up. Hightower's commentaries are brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown, the monthly newsletter with Hightower's take on what Wall Street and Washington are up to. For information, visit HightowerLowdown.org. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Sophie Bushwick. Got a minute? Plants can pull carbon dioxide, the planet-warming greenhouse gas, out of Earth's atmosphere. But these aren't the only living organisms that affect carbon dioxide levels and thus global warming. Nope, I'm not talking about humans. Humble sea otters can also reduce greenhouse gases by indirectly helping kelp plants. That finding is in the journal Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. Researchers used 40 years of data to look at the effect of sea otter populations on kelp. Depending on the plant density, one square meter of kelp forest can absorb anywhere from tens to hundreds of grams of carbon per year. But when sea otters are around, kelp density is high and the plants can suck up more than 12 times as much carbon. That's because otters nosh on kelp-eating sea urchins. In the mammal's presence, the urchins hide away and feed on kelp detritus rather than living, carbon-absorbing plants. So climate researchers need to note that the herbivores that eat plants, and the predators that eat them, also have roles to play in the carbon cycle. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Sophie Bushwick. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Please support The David Pakman Show for free by doing all of your Amazon.com shopping through the black banner at davidpakman.com. Click it, bookmark it, use it every time you shop. You can find the link on our Twitter and Facebook pages as well. You can also become a David Pakman Show member. Today's new member announcement made possible by liberalbias.com. Lewis, do you ever gaze into your cereal bowl in the morning and think you see liberal bias in there? Every morning. You're not alone. You can find out more at liberalbias.com. Today's new member of the day, Virginia Buccella. Great to have Virginia aboard. Uh, every David Pakman Show member, very, very important. Now, I wonder if Virginia Buccella is the only David Pakman Show member whose first or last name are that of a U.S. state. That's a question we'd have to do. We'd have to get our team on that. Hmm. No other Virginias? No. What about Washington? Is there is that? Stephanie, Massachusetts. I guess that would be count, but other than that, maybe it's just other, the two of them. I don't know about that. Yeah. I think that may be made up. <laughs> Mitt Romney is doing something that I wrote about in a recent national newspaper column, which I do once a month, which is the art of projection, projecting onto others something that you do. Fox News is great at this, t talking about how biased others are when really Fox News is incredibly biased. This is the epitome of that. Mitt Romney saying, hey, guys, you've got to be careful. I'm, I'm thinking Barack Obama might lie in debates because he's, he's kind of a liar. This is what he said to George Stephanopoulos this week, and um, it's, it's pretty absurd. Here's the video of it. Very, very strange stuff, Lewis. What you learned as you studied all this about President Obama as a debater? What are you looking for? Well, uh, I think he's going to say a lot of things that aren't accurate. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'd, I'd be tempted to go back to that wonderful line by Ronald Reagan, there you go again, but you can't, you can't use something that's Bill Clinton been... used that about you the other day at the Democratic Convention. As another president once said, <laughs> there they go again. Walked right into that one. I, I didn't happen to see that. But I think the, the challenge that I'll have uh, in the debate is that the president uh, tends to uh, 
uh, how shall I say it, uh, say things that aren't true <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and in attacking uh, his opponents. I've looked at prior debates and, and in that kind of case it's, it's difficult to, to say, well, am I going to spend my time correcting things that aren't quite accurate <laughs> or am I going to spend my time talking about the things I want to talk about? And, right. And so, so this is, it, what, do you guys think that this so, well, is... From what I understand, in a debate you answer questions. Right. And that should be the topic, but as we know, rarely... Uh, is the answer related to the, the question. Do you guys think that this is just kind of standard Romney nonsense, or is this Romney already laying the groundwork for excusing why he doesn't do well in the debates? Like, what, what do you think this, the, this, is there strategy behind this, or is it just typical Romney nonsense? There's strategy behind it. I you mean, think I, so? I don't think he's really setting himself up, but uh, for the debate, I mean, I think that's kind of impossible to do. But, I mean, it, any opportunity you get to slam your opponent, you take it. And calling him a liar is, uh, is a pretty good one. What do you think, Natan? I mean, particularly because Mitt Romney is the liar. He's, he's, he's lied about everything from social issues to fiscal issues to where he's worked and when he worked and all these different things. Uh, what, what do you, how do you interpret this, Natan? I think he's trying to inoculate himself against the media spin that's going to go on after the debate. And since I think he can objectively anticipate that it's going to favor Obama in the fact-checking analysis, he's going to try to preempt that by just saying that even that is off, that it's just, it's just a lie, if not in the details, in the general broad picture that he's painting. Yeah, that may be the case. And of course, as we know, the Republican National Convention really giving those fact-checkers a lot of work, whereas as we saw on the Democratic side, uh, sticking to truth and reality a lot more, Lewis. Truth and reality are, are, are the best things. Uh, if, if you're into truth and reality, Mitt is not your candidate. <laughs> yeah. If you are into a fact-based candidacy, Mitt Romney is not the guy you want to be voting for, and particularly not Paul Ryan. Yeah. I think, uh, speaking of, of reality, let's, uh, let's talk about Mitt's, Mitt's other guest. Yeah, this is incredible. Uh, during the same interview with George Stephanopoulos, Mitt Romney was kind of casually asked, well, he mentioned middle-income people. So George Stephanopoulos says, well, what do you mean by middle-income? And Romney says, you know, 200000 to $250,000 a year uh, of, uh, of income or less. Here's that clip. This is, this is pretty shocking stuff, okay? I'm, I'm warning you. It's a disturbing cl uh, audio and video piece. Keep the burden down on middle-income taxpayers. $100,000 middle-income? Well, no, middle-income is two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000 and less. So number one, don't reduce... Excuse me, don't raise taxes on middle-income people. Lower them. Number two... There you go. Don't so, yeah, I mean, middle-income, Lewis, it's... It's just, it's, it's about a quarter million a year. That's middle income. Now, later on, his campaign went on to clarify what he was talking about was household income, not individual. It doesn't matter, though, because according to the Census Bureau, the uh, median household income is about $50,000, okay? Mitt Romney says it's two hundred dollars to $250,000. That's only five times more, okay? So even, even if you're talking about household income, it's still completely nonsense. Here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Mitt Romney is completely out of touch with reality. And the reality is the average household in America. He can't relate. His family earns about 20 million a year. He pays only 14% taxes. He doesn't really work. Of course, he had those speaking fees, which weren't really very much. Of course, they were $374,000 in 2011, which of course would be uh, close to 10 times, the uh, eight or so times the average household income. Um, if Mitt Romney, knows how the economy works, if this is the guy who knows how to create jobs, as he says, or he knows how American families really would do better, if he's the guy who would be a good president because of his business experience, something he has touted, he is the guy who the country needs right now, shouldn't he at least know roughly within two standard deviations what the average American household income is? Is that unreasonable to expect? No, uh, I also love how he says he's going to cut taxes on, on people who make 250000 and less, mm. as if that goes all the way down, as if everybody who makes less than 250000 a year is going to get a tax break. And as if he's not going to cut them for the people that make over that amount by an incredibly an absurd amount right. as well. Let's so talk about there. who gets the, the higher uh, break, the bigger it, break. It, is uh, mainstream media, right-wing media, conservative media, corporate media going to brand this as a gotcha question? What do you consider middle income? Is that under 100000 or No, 200000 to 250000 It's like 
Name a newspaper that you read from Katie Couric to Sarah Palin. It's, it was a gotcha. That was an unfair question. How could you possibly, unprepared, expect the economic expert, Mitt Romney, to know what an average household makes, even within uh, 200,000? You, you can't expect that. You can't expect your, your next president to know what, uh, what people are making in, in the country he lives in. This is Anne drives a couple of Cadillacs. I get speaker fees from time to time, but not very much. It's $374,000 a year. Middle income household is about uh, 200000 250000 a year. There if you, you want to go to Harvard, just borrow money from your parents. Why even borrow it? They'll just give it to you as a gift. Yeah. The Mitt Romney campaign website has been caught plagiarizing President Obama's campaign website. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. This is a great article at The Examiner from Lou Collagiovanni, our friend over at the We Survive Bush, You'll Survive Obama Facebook page. Mitt Romney's campaign has been caught cutting corners on their website. They have this page, which is the donation page, exactly verbatim a copy of the Obama page that was published five months earlier. This is the donation page on each respective website, and it says, after you've, this is the Obama one, after you've saved your credit card and phone number and your BarackObama.com account, you can use your cell phone to make a donation. All you need to do is text the amount you want to give. If you text us 10, we'll charge your saved credit card $10. It's never been easier to donate. Here's the Romney page. After you've saved your credit card and phone number in your MyMit account, you can use your cell phone to make a donation. All you need to do is text the amount you want to give. If you text us 10, we'll charge your saved credit card $10. It's never been easier to donate. Now, you might say, well, listen, you can't blame the campaign. It's possible the websites are managed by big companies that manage campaign websites for all candidates. There's any number of explanations. All of those things have been looked into. None of them are true. This was literally just copied and pasted. Okay. What do you think of that? Um, at first, I did think that, okay, maybe it's the same company that is right. uh, managing both of their web pages. Uh, that's... That's pretty strange. I Mitt mean, Romney, did, did someone think this. that no one would pick up on this? Well, it's funny. Mitt Romney's digital director, Zach Moffat, claimed this was a junior staff confusion that has been updated and resolved. They were confused. Initially, they thought the Mitt Romney website should be a copy of President Obama's. Now they're no longer confused and need to know that the website copy needs to be written on its own. Glad we cleared that up. <laughs> if blatant plagiarism and non admitting the guilt wasn't bad enough, then Zach Moffat gave another interview where he said, quote, I think our online ad team is superior to Obama's. It's where we pride ourselves as a campaign to be cutting edge. Yeah, cutting and pasting apparently was, is what he means by cutting edge. Um, remember that time also when they misspelled America Amersha on that app? Yeah. The online digital team is fantastic over on the Romney side. Excellent. Keep up the good, nice good work, work, guys. Great stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lewis. You're welcome. Nothing else on this? Not really. Pretty much speaks for itself. I mean, I, I think uh, I'm sure a lot of what these staffers and campaign workers are doing are saying the Obama campaign has been running pretty smooth and his last campaign was one of the best run campaigns in the history of America. Let's just see what they're doing and do the same thing. Yeah, maybe, let's maybe literally we'll just win. copy their page. Yeah, let's copy their platform, too. Hey, let's copy Obamacare. Oh, wait a second. That was actually very similar. I mean, to I Romney guess it's Care. copies all around here. <laughs> well, very I mean, you could say Obama copied Romney in that in that case. Yeah, of course, Romney would deny it. Right. Okay, let's take a break. Coming up next, Scott Keeter from Pew Research Center. What's going on with the polls? Then after that, disturbing story about the Boy Scouts and hiding pedophilia in the style reminiscent of the Catholic Church. And we'll also do the trivia winners from our Thursday question. People ready to win some free membership. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Repair the World Apparel, offering eco-friendly clothing manufactured using no new natural resources or chemical dyes, available at repairtheworldnow.com. ShareFile, provider of secure file transfer for businesses at sharefile.com. I'm Matt Rothschild, the editor of The Progressive Magazine, with my Progressive Point of View, which you can also grab off our website over at progressive.org. It looks like there's going to be a settlement in the Chicago teachers' strike, which I'm really grateful for, not only for the kids and their parents, but for the teachers, too, who valiantly hit the picket lines to stand up for public education, only to be vilified in the national press. 
What Rahm Emanuel was trying to do was to further the so-called reform agenda, which is nothing of the sort. The goal of this push is to open the school doors to private companies and to turn our schools into test-taking factories that drill the dull into kids. The mania for test-taking, which both George W. Bush and Barack Obama have signed on to, reduces the curriculum into rote lessons about how to fill in little circles with a number two pencil. The Chicago Teachers Union has done us all a favor by rebelling against this stultifying approach. The solution to our education problems isn't more standardized tests and more charter schools. Part of the solution is smaller class sizes and decent facilities. In Chicago, 100 schools lack playgrounds. 160 of them have no libraries at all. The other part of the solution is social. In Chicago, more than 80% of the kids come from families under the poverty line. Let's attack poverty, not teachers. Then and only then may every kid have a chance at our fabled equality of opportunity. I'm Matt Rothschild, and that's how I see it. It's the Howdyland.com News Bullet with Stan Douglas. Go to Howdyland.com and click on the Funny Time special offer to receive your free sample issue today. A new study by the Federal Hindsight Commission proves once and for all that everything advertised for sale on television is very bad for you and will lead you to certain ruination and despair. The study's chief coordinator, Heather Wilcox, explains. We believe increased deregulation of the public relations industry will bring a quicker and more painless end to everything and everyone we know and love. And finally, now that creeping illiteracy has rendered 9 out of 10 Americans unable to read or sign their own names, the rules against talking out loud in public libraries were lifted by Congress today. Permission to raise and kill chickens in the reference section, however, will remain strictly controlled for reasons no one in the government has yet to explain. This Howdyland.com News Bullet was powered by the seductive pull of logic and science in a world of superstition and fear. I'm Stan Douglas. This is the Media Matters Minute. I'm Matt White. Fox News' coverage of Libya is drawing new criticism in the wake of the attack on the U.S. consulate in Benghazi. During Sean Hannity's Fox News show, Hannity suggested that only he and a few other Fox hosts correctly predicted the violent actions that transpired this week in Libya. Republican Senator John McCain responded by criticizing the host and his network for their coverage of events in Libya. It was you and people on Fox that said, in Libya, we didn't know who they were, and let's not help these people. They had an election, and they elected moderates. They rejected Islamists. And yes, there are al-Qaeda factors, and there are extremists in Libya today, but the Libyan people are friends of ours, and they support us, and they support democracy. I don't so, you were wrong about, so you were wrong about Libya. I don't think I was wrong about Libya at all. I McCain also called out Fox News for its fear-mongering over Libyan elections on July 11th during during an interview with Greta Van Susteren. For this and other stories, please visit MediaMatters.org and follow us on Twitter at MMFA. This is the story of how the war on women is now being fought in Texas. I'm singer-songwriter Patty Larkin, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. In Texas, Planned Parenthood has been running some 49 clinics that perform no abortions, but do offer basic health services such as cancer screening and contraceptive care. These clinics do not offer abortions because Texas has had a law that prevents any public money from going to any abortion provider. So, in order to comply with that rule, these centers maintain a very strict legal and financial separation from any other Planned Parenthood organization that does provide abortions. But that's no longer good enough, says Texas. This year, the state put in place a regulation that says if any entity shares a name with any organization that does promote abortion, then they're affiliated, and all affiliated organizations can't receive any funding. With the result that the feds must now phase out support for the program, which annually serves more than 100,000 uninsured low-income women, because the regulation violates federal law. The Conservative Court of Appeals for Texas has just lifted the injunction that prohibits this rule from going into effect, which the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, calls a win for Texas women. And if you're fighting a war against women, I guess this probably does count as a win. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself.
The David Pakman Show is made possible by listeners like you. To get a commercial-free version of our podcast, as well as all of our other member benefits, go to davidpakman.com slash membership. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Joining me is Scott Keeter, Director of Survey Research at the Pew Research Center. Scott, great as always to talk to you. A good place to start is with the conventions. We had first the Republican National Convention, then the Democratic National Convention. I have a couple of, of specific questions about those, but first, how do the convention bounces, as they're, as they're referenced, look now that we've uh, passed both conventions? It appears that Barack Obama got a bounce and Mitt Romney did not. <laughs> uh, if you look at the Gallup poll, which is useful because they have documented convention bounces going back several decades, right. uh, Barack Obama ended up with a three-point bounce in the Gallup poll and, Bar- and uh, Mitt Romney actually lost a point in his poll from <laughs> uh, in his poll numbers from before to after, or you could call that a net four positive for Obama. And that actually is a bounce that's in the sort of the middle of the pack for bounces over the years. We've, we've had conventions in the past that have been, you know, much better for one side or the other. For example, uh, the 1992 Democratic Convention was great for Bill Clinton. Um, but more recently, they've tended to be modest in the uh, three to five point range. And so Obama's net positive of four is probably about uh, the average uh, for that period. But uh, but clearly, you've seen this bounce not only in the Gallup poll, but in lots of other polls that have come out since the conventions. Okay, so now comparing to the last time we had a, a challenger against an incumbent president, which would have been John Kerry against George W. Bush, when we compare to that, am I correct in remembering that with that convention series, we had Kerry lose two and Bush gain one? Am I right in remembering that? Or is, or is right. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, there wasn't much of a net benefit, certainly not for Kerry. But you remember, Kerry's convention was in uh, was in July, and then it was uh, some time before Bush's convention. So Bush got the better of the situation in the in the end uh, because of the timing of the conventions. Of course, this time Obama's convention was the last one, and uh, you know it may be it may be to your benefit to to have your convention last okay see that was going to be my next question which is we were hypothesizing here in the studio that aside from whether it's a challenger versus incumbent president or two uh, 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 potential candidates with an outgoing president that there's always a benefit it's always better to go last simply because you're the you can number one respond to the first convention if you want to and number two because you're just more recent in people's minds is that true now, or, and, and does that fade by the time it's November, or is that something that seems to hold true all the way to the election? I think we have to, have to you know, acknowledge that there's still a lot of campaigning to happen. There's still a lot of events that could happen. And so while the convention bounces have, have typically been good, because they, they do serve an important function in raising the visibility of the candidates, particularly the challenger of, of giving him some definition in terms of uh, his basic personality and, and attributes, um, a lot happens after the conventions. It tends to moderate the effects of them. I mean, I think, for example, even though um, we saw uh, John McCain pull, even with Barack Obama, in a lot of polls after the Republican convention in 2008, um, that dissolved fairly quickly. Um, and uh, even, even though John Kerry didn't end up having a very uh, good uh, net convention cycle, um, he ended up doing very well in the first debate and was able to pull even with Bush uh, on the basis of that performance. There's a lot to come yet. Let's look a little bit at the swing states. Over the weekend, I was doing a little bit of reading about different swing state polls. Some claimed, wow, look at what's happening in North Carolina. It was Rasmussen, by the way, who said in North Carolina, um, President Obama, even though he had his convention there, has fallen well behind Mitt Romney. At the same time, we had polls saying Ohio and Florida are increasingly looking like they're slipping from the grasp of Mitt Romney. What are you seeing in some of the key swing states that could decide the election ultimately? I'm looking at the same polls that, that you are. We we don't do uh, individual state polls, and I would say my observation is is similar. Um, you know, actually, the the swing state 
surveys that we've been looking at are all pretty close, but the one thing that they have in common is that most of them, with the exception of North Carolina, which I think is a particularly difficult case for Obama, uh, are showing a slight uh, Obama advantage, and it's been consistent. It, it uh, increased in some states after the conventions, and um, it, it's been it's been holding on. I mean, but we're talking about two, three, maybe four point advantages. But the math for um, for Romney doesn't look uh, that appealing, given the fact that he needs to be able to pick up more than one of the big swing states in order to find a path to 270 electoral votes. Last thing I want to touch on, and this is actually kind of an interesting thing. Last week we interviewed Professor Alan Lichtman, who I'm not sure how familiar with him you are, but he has this system where it's 13 different kind of subjective, although he would argue objective, keys uh, as to uh, the state of the po uh, presidential election. And he, while he doesn't say polls don't matter, it's a very different way of going about predicting elections in the sense that when you do polling, you look at what's my sample and did I represent cell phone only people enough and all of these specific questions. And he kind of says you can move back from that and take a, a 40,000 feet view of the election in a much different way. And he says, and he has at least for the last seven elections, uh, seven or eight elections predicted accurately. As a pollster, what's your view of that type of system? Well, his system and others that are similar to it are looking at the things that actually feed into the production of public attitudes about the candidates. And so I don't see them as inconsistent or incompatible ways of analyzing the election. It's just that the, that the polling provides us with a summary of all of the things that could be going on, the presence or absence of an incumbent, the popularity or the successes of, of the, the in-party and the out-party, what's going on in Congress, what's going on with the economy, uh, polls are just kind of a summary of all of that, and they really ought to be consistent with, uh, with those kinds of measures. Larry Sabato is another person who has a similar kind of uh, number of keys to the election model. Okay, interesting stuff. So uh, as of right now, would you agree generally we're seeing some kind of broad-based momentum towards President Obama? Is, is it too early to say that? Could it still be just the results of the, of the latter convention? What do you think? I, I think that the, the race is fairly stable right now. I think there was some momentum that was largely a result of, of the conventions, but may also have been fed by events that have happened since then. But I really you know, always try to caution it when, when I talk about the polls is that there's a lot to happen yet. We have four debates that are going to happen. Any one of them could end up being, you know, a disaster for either party that would have an impact on their their chances. And as the events in Libya and the, across the Middle East remind us, there are, there are a lot of things in the world that can happen, including two more jobs reports um, that can have an impact on the campaign and, and how voters are actually going to decide. So too early to seal anyone's doom. All right, Scott Keeter, Director of Survey Research at the Pew Research Center. Thanks as always, Scott, and we'll check in with you once these debates get going. Thank you, David. Enjoy talking with you. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show is made possible in part by Greenfield Savings Bank, building strong communities one account at a time with offices in Greenfield, Amherst, Conway, Shelburne Falls, South Deerfield, and Turner's Falls, and online at greenfieldsavings.com. Repair the World Apparel, offering eco-friendly clothing manufactured using no new natural resources or chemical dyes, available at repairtheworldnow.com. Feedback video and animation at feedbackvideo.net. What are we to make of Julian Assange hiding out in Ecuador's embassy in London in order to avoid extradition to Sweden, where he is wanted for questioning about allegations of a sexual assault in 2010? I'm Dan Ellsberg, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Assange actually has committed himself to reporting to Sweden, but only if Sweden agrees to not extradite him to the United States, and Sweden and the United States won't agree to that. Because... 
WikiLeaks has revealed indiscriminate killings of Baghdad civilians by United States military personnel, revealed our government's collusion with Yemen's dictatorship, clarified Obama's pressure on other nations to not prosecute Bush-era officials for torture, and much, much more. For revealing these inconvenient and uncomfortable truths, the United States government probably wants to lock him up for what it will call unauthorized disclosure of classified information. In a recent New York Times op-ed piece on this topic, Academy Award-winning filmmakers Oliver Stone and Michael Moore state, If the United States can prosecute a journalist for publishing outside the United States facts that the government doesn't like, then the governments of Russia or China could, by the same logic, demand that foreign reporters anywhere on Earth be extradited to those countries for violating their laws. Such a precedent, they say, should deeply concern everyone, whether they admire WikiLeaks or not. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is Scientific American 60 Second Mind. I'm Christy Nicholson. Got a minute? Should we worry if we have doubts before saying, I do? Some say it's normal to feel doubt. But new research suggests that pre-wedding uncertainty actually predicts marital dissatisfaction, especially when that doubt is coming from the bride. Scientists surveyed 232 couples within the first three months of marriage and then did follow-up surveys every six months for four years. The average age for the men was 27, for the women, 25. In the first survey, 47% of men and only 38% of women said they had, at some point, felt uncertain about their upcoming marriage. Four years later, 10% of couples in which only the guy had doubts wound up divorced. But when the gal was uncertain, 18% of the couples split up. And when both parties had doubts, the divorce rate was only slightly higher, at 20%. The study is in the Journal of Family Psychology. Overall, when the bride is uncertain, she is two and a half times more likely to be divorced within four years, compared with women who expressed no hesitation before tying the knot. So, at least some of the time, that pre-wedding doubt seems well-founded. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Mind, I'm Christy Nicholson. The David Pakman Show depends on members and donors to stay going and growing. Think about becoming a David Pakman Show member at davidpakman.com. You get access to an entire members-only bonus show with behind the scenes and everything we didn't get to on the regular show, extra interviews, plus access to the entire lifetime archive of all of our shows, even the ones from the very beginning that I really wish nobody would ever hear again. Plus, trust me, it'll feel great to support 100% independent media. Go to davidpakman.com and become a member today. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. A lot of stories still to get to. The best way to support The David Pakman Show, because we are mostly funded by individual memberships, is to get a membership. Go to davidpakman.com slash membership. Ton of great benefits, Lewis. Yeah, of course. It's, it's the best David Pakman Show bonus show there is. Absolutely. This is an incredible story, but not a surprising one. Uh, uh, does that make sense? Incredible, but not surprising. Mm. Boy Scouts have now uncovered, a number of documents have now been uncovered, which show that the Boy Scouts have helped alleged molesters, child molesters, cover their tracks. Over two decades, the Boy Scouts of America failed to report hundreds of alleged child molesters to police. They often hid allegations from parents and the public. They often would uh, uh, have the, the um, alleged perpetrator resign and move them around, never prosecute all the records very often showing just, oh, we regretfully accept your resignation. This is a Los Angeles Times review of 1,600 confidential files dating from 1970 to 91. And this is very, very disturbing stuff, Lewis. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. I mean, we've known for a while that the Boy Scouts is kind of like religious propaganda. Well, that's the thing. The similarities between the Catholic Church and the Boy Scouts are increasing in number as we get this information. Now, this morning, I was reading some of the rebuttals from the Boy Scouts of America to this, including, well, listen, th those files are people that were on the ineligible volunteer list. In other words, it was a list of people who aren't eligible to volunteer because of these accusations. Well, number one, that's just not true with a lot of these. I looked through, through more information relating to that. And number two, 
they are no longer eligible to volunteer because they've left because it might be really bad for the Boy Scouts to be found out that these guys are volunteering, but they were never reported to police. They were never prosecuted. And case in point, the Los Angeles Times, uh, uh, I, the journalist's name escapes me right now, he did in a CNN interview this morning go on the record and saying some of these individuals who molested in one case 20 different Boy Scouts went on after leaving the Boy Scouts to molest other children. It's despicable, disturbing stuff. And you know what? You've got to be as a parent. I would be very, very scared to have my child near the Catholic Church and near the Boy Scouts of America. Both are e extremely concerning to me. Yeah, and let's face it, if you're going to molest or rape children, you're going to put yourself in positions where it's easier to do. You're going to work for the church. You're now, going, that being said, hold we're on, not hold on, saying everybody know, who does that. I know. Hold on. Okay, all you're right. going to work for the church. You're going to work for, you're going to do the Boy Scouts. You're going to be a teacher. You're going to live near a school. You're going to do things like that. And, I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to happen in situations where you're off in the woods alone with boys or whatever you're doing with the Boy Scouts or in the, the back of a church somewhere. Uh, than it is in a schoolroom. And we're not saying everyone does this, but that's what they do. They put themselves in positions where it's easy for them to, to molest and rape children. It's just interesting to me because aren't there alternatives? In other words, do, is, it, is it necessary? Is the Boy Scouts the only group? Is the Catholic Church the only place you can put your kids? Of course, certainly there could be religious motivation there, and I assume there is in many cases. It's, it's deeply concerning to me, and I, I just don't know what, what is the solution. I mean, certainly... I think churches starting to lose um, nonprofit status is going to would have a huge effect. I don't know if it's going to happen, but given all of the political posturing that goes on within church, churches about supporting specific candidates, which violates nonprofit uh, uh, statutes, we have to start taking action against a lot of these organizations. And you know what? On the Boy Scouts thing, the president of the U.S. I forget the title. He's kind of like the honorary president or honorary chief of the Boy Scouts, President Obama should come out and it's, it is time to renounce that and say, I am, I am, to quote Sarah Palin, I am refudiating that honorary title because it's, it is, uh, what's going on is just not okay and really making a stand. I don't think it'll happen. Probably won't happen because this isn't a, a mainstream story, really. I it mean, was on CNN today, though, understandably. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's, it's not going to be on TV for a week, for the whole week, uh, on every station. Um, a lot of people aren't going to know about this at all, so I don't think it's something Obama necessarily has to do. But, uh, yeah, it would be nice. Absolutely. Okay, last Thursday, I did a trivia question and said, if people get this right, we will give away memberships. If it's like 50 people who get it right, we'll pick five and give away memberships. The question was this. Which European country is the biggest consumer of The David Pakman Show, as judged by podcast downloads, YouTube views, and website visits? Okay, those were the three barometers. Now, I got hundreds of emails about this. A lot of people said Sweden. Now, I was surprised about Sweden for two reasons. Number one, I was surprised because I don't know why so many people would think, think that in Sweden people are that interested in this show. But number two, because Sweden actually is one of the most popular countries in Europe for the David Pakman show. Right. Unfortunately, it is not the most popular, Lewis. Okay. Then, understandably, I got a lot of emails. I would say 80% of the emails I got, 85% said, it's got to be England. It's English-speaking. You have this segment with Dennis Campbell, who's over in the United Kingdom. It just makes sense that it be England. England must be the European country. However, that is also wrong, Lewis, unfortunately. For those people, the majority, uh, probably close to the full 200, were saying England, about 85%. Not right either. Right. So what is the actual country? Well, the other one I got was Spain. Now, why would it be Spain? Yes, I'm from Argentina. But just because I'm from a South American country that happens to speak the same language that they speak in Spain, why would that mean that Spain is a big consumer of the David Pakman show? Why would that be, Lewis? I don't know. I think uh, some people probably just wanted to throw out something random out there and not go for the obvious, obvious answers. Right. And they would have been wrong in guessing Spain as well because it, it just makes no sense. It's just, it just not. Right. What is the actual country? It is, of course, Iceland. No, I'm just kidding. It's not Iceland, even though Lewis did visit there. And they were they actually specifically said, we avoid the David Pakman show specifically. Didn't they tell you that? Yeah. The locals in Iceland? No one would come near me. Yeah, it was, it was a difficult trip for Lewis. Yeah. No, there were only three people who guessed the correct country. And those three people have names, all of which start with the letter X. No, the letter M. All right, you need to stop. <laughs> 
So Mike Herring, Matthew McCartney, and Mike Greff all correctly guessed Germany. Germany is the country in Europe where the David Pakman show is the most popular. Even though English is not maybe the obvious language as it would be in the United Kingdom in England, uh, a lot of people do learn English in Germany. Is it at this point, uh, every, do all students in school learn English now? I believe so. Is that right? Yep. All right, but that being said, uh, th only three people guessed correctly and they will have free David Pakman show membership. So congratulations to the two Mikes, Herring and Greff, as well as Matthew McCartney. Great, great stuff. Thursday, we'll have another trivia question. We'll give you the weekend. And then next Monday, we'll give away some more free memberships, Lewis. Sure. Absolutely. Let's go to voicemail and email, why don't we? Our voicemail line is open 24 hours a day. You can call it at 2192-DAVID-P. This email about Lewis not voting. Voicemail. This voicemail about Lewis not voting is the most angry voicemail, I think, that we've ever had about anything. Let's get right into it, Lewis. Are you ready for this? Because it's, it's pretty, Please. It's, uh, it's, it's a shocking voice. I'm sitting down. Okay. Yeah, David, it's Charles in New Jersey. I am calling to flame the sh out of Lewis. I just saw the clip about him not voting. What kind of horse is that? Um, I thought it was bad enough that dude just kind of sits there with his arms folded looking <laughs> like an introverted, you know, whatever. You know, but I figured, I don't know, maybe that's just his stage presence or whatever. Maybe if you got him out from underneath the camera, maybe he comes to life, you know. But I guess I'm finding out that that's not the case. That underneath all of his, uh, I don't know, activism, I mean, why are you even being political if you don't vote? <laughs> what is the point? Just to learn that Lewis is a flaky little piece of fluff that does nothing but sit pushing dials, wearing headphones, arms folded. Dude, get out and vote, you flaky little flake. Lewis, would you like to respond? <laughs> okay. The argument that I, I can't comment on, on politics and what's going on in the country because I don't vote, I mean, why don't I just not comment on football because I don't play in the NFL? Or why don't I not comment on the food I get at a restaurant because I didn't cook it? Not really a valid argument, I don't think. Okay. And... Uh, Okay, I understand. You, you you don't like it that I don't vote. Um, I would argue that my work on this show, my production of this show, has a much greater impact than my one vote would have producing this show. I don't know. I would agree. I would also argue okay. oh, wow. that Lewis it has a much here. greater impact than my vote and his vote combined. Would you like to cancel this gentleman's vote? Um, I don't know who he's voting for. Oh, okay. I don't know. Listen, I agree with you as far as the presidential side, but you've got to vote for Elizabeth Warren. I want to go out, and I, that will be a close race. I want to videotape Lewis voting. We'll do a whole special. We'll film I know, what, I know, I know what you want to do. It doesn't yeah. mean it's going to happen. Well, well, I think we should do it. It would be a really good special. Natan, don't you agree? Yeah, let me just make one point separate from this. We usually make the point that uh, it doesn't matter who you vote for in strongly red or strongly blue states like Massachusetts, for example, that we live in. However, you could argue that it is important to vote uh, because the popular vote does matter in terms of how much political capital the candidate that wins has right. to, in his mandate. So if Obama wins 49 to 48 and a third party candidate gets 2 or 3%, it's different than if he gets 53% in terms of the four year presidency. No question about it. Lewis should be voting. This is, I believe, the year where Lewis comes out of his shell. He votes. We film it. It's incredible. It becomes a, a worldwide phenomenon, and then uh, just everything changes. Don't get too excited, Dave. All right, a couple of quick emails. The man who killed 70,000 chickens by turning off a light switch and then falling asleep in his own urine. Uh, wow, the most amazing part of that story was the wholesale cost per chicken is like 30 cents. I've been getting ripped off at KFC for so long. Yeah, that is shocking. Not a light switch. The power, actually. The power to the chicken coop killed 70,000 chickens. Incredible. And then someone saying, yeah, you know what? I have a friend who's a chicken farmer. She says if the ventilation and heating is shut down, chickens die in 15 minutes, especially if they're older. There's alarm systems and backup generators. A while back, they had work done by the alarm company. They shut down the system to work on it and went to lunch, came back 50,000 dead chickens. Yeah. Disturbing. It is. And on the Border Patrol agent who shot a, um, a man over the river border into Mexico. I don't know the status of this particular stretch of border, but Border Patrol agents must be hypersensitive to all threats given the cartel's ruthlessness. All right, that's it for today's show. 
Right after the show, we're doing the member call-in. So if you're, if you're a member, we'll see you on there. We'll see you on the bonus show. Otherwise, tomorrow afternoon. Thanks for watching. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.